and then okay so i'm going to begin with um a land, land acknowledgement uh, specific to where i live and work um, but i know we have guests from all over so i also encourage you uh, all to maybe let us know in the chat box specifically where you're joining from um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, this land on which um, the University of Toronto operates and in which I live and work. Uh, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We also acknowledge that for some racialized non-Indigenous peoples, coming to Turtle Island was not a choice. So again, welcome everyone to tonight's event, Preserving and Sharing the Legacies of Muslims in Canada, uh, or the MICA Showcase, as uh, I like to kind of say, I call it for short. Uh, my name is Mosca, and I'll basically be your main host for today. So today we're going to go over uh, what we've done here at MICA over the past year as the Muslims in Canada Archive. I'll talk a little bit about the team behind MICA. Um, from there, I really want to focus on the donations of records that we've received this past year, um, our uh, outreach strategy, how it worked, uh, and then we'll walk you through an example donation that we're currently wor working on right now. I'll also give everyone a glance into uh, what we're working on outside of the donations as well, uh, so in our plans for the future and how you can uh, get involved. And we'll be also hearing from uh, our record, two of our records donors, as well as some amazing supporters too. And again, at the end, we do have a uh, kind of open Q&A session too. Oh. So I'll start off with a um, kind of a more proper introduction again. Uh, so my name is Mosca and I'm the archivist for the Muslims in Canada Archive. I have a Master of Information in Archives and Records Management from the University of Toronto Faculty of Information. Um, I'm also a board member of the Archives Association of Ontario as well. It's not, I don't think it, no, it's not on the list, um, but I'm also an external advisor for the Documentary Heritage Communities Program, which is a program out of the federal government's Library and Archives Canada that kind of helps fund uh, community and hi community history and archival projects. Uh, I, and I came to MICA, uh, to the MICA project specifically in 2019, and I've been kind of part of it ever since. So MICA is based in um, the University of Toronto's Institute of Islamic Studies, and it has an awesome, awesome, great um, and wonderful group of people involved in it, uh, who I'm lucky to call my team. Um, I just wanted to introduce them, or even, I guess, maybe even reintroduce them uh, to some of you that maybe already know them. Uh, so first, first we have Professor Anvar Iman, who's the director of the institute, and has a couple of words to say after I after I introduce everyone else. Um, he's the the director of the Institute of Islamic Studies at the University of, uh, at the University of Toronto. We also have Hassan, who's our digital fellow. Um, he's in charge of developing our uh, kind of our online platforms. Hassan is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Information at U of T. And of course, we have uh, Emily, our micro senior fellow, an amazing, amazing Master of Information student who is graduating this June and leaving me <laughs> very soon. Um, my, Micah would not be possible without this uh, wonderful and passionate group of people. Um, and especially the one who kind of started it all and brought us together, Amber. This is your time to shine. Well, I don't want to uh, take too much time. I just want to say to everyone, thank you for joining us. You know, we're just a few days away from the beginning of Ramadan. And, um, you know, when I was growing up and as a kid and we were fasting, we would oftentimes spend the time of Ramadan uh, reflecting on our lives and where we want to go after Ramadan and how Ramadan might be an opportunity for us to think uh, anew um, as, as Eve then comes upon us. And one of the ways that I'm hoping this event helps us think about Ramadan is we're really interested in where you've been. And Micah, we're, we're hoping that as you um, embark upon uh, this time in Ramadan for many of you who are who are observant, um, that we hope you'll take the time to think about where you've been, take, a, take the time to look in those 
archives and, and that you might have in your basement. Uh, it's going to be hard to work. I, I, you know, for me, I always find it a little harder to, you know, around three or four o'clock, five o'clock, I'm not the most productive, but maybe uh, head into the basement, take a look at those boxes and see what um, might, might be something to preserve for the future. And so our, our hope at Mike is that this Ramadan will be a time of reflection on a past that we hope you'll share with us and we'd like to help preserve. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Um, and actually speaking of that, I, I think uh, it would be helpful to just really quickly go over to um, what MICA is for those who don't know. Um, as an archive, um, MICA came to exist because Canadian Muslim communities have largely been un, uh, misrepresented by mainstream media and other non-Muslim sources. Uh, MICA wants to talk back to these offensive and incorrect narratives by creating a more robust and representative account of Muslims in Canada by Muslims in Canada. Um, so we're, like I mentioned, we're housed at the Institute of Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, and uh, this, our specific archive is, is focused on Ontario right now, but we also have uh, um, academic partners uh, across the country, like including Memorial University um, uh, out in Newfoundland and uh, Université Laval in Quebec, um, with the goal of kind of spreading across the country, province by province, uh, eventually as well. So uh, essentially, uh, MICA puts Muslims in control of preserving and sharing their experiences and rich histories for generations to come. Uh, we stress the importance of representing all facets of ca Canada's diverse Muslim communities, especially traditionally marginalized identities within Muslim communities. And so as such, we make sure that our different definition of Canadian Muslim or Muslim in Canada is as broad as possible and kind of focuses on self-identification. So, um, MICA acquires, uh, organizes, preserves, and shares uh, records of and about Canadian Muslim individuals and organizations in order to preserve Canadian Muslim histories. We kind of like to say that uh, MICA balances both, you know, like adherence to professional like archival standards, and that it's also community centered. And we do this through, uh, you know, consistent consultation and partnerships with both Canadian Muslim organizations and community members, as well as uh, really strong relationships with major archival institutions uh, for professional guidance. So the records we uh, the records we collect can manifest in many many different ways, and I often get asked asked uh, you know what what do you want from me? What kind of records do you want? Um, what is of value to you? And I always say that we collect almost anything that is like maybe isn't three dimensional. Um, so here we, I always have this list ready in hand for those kinds of questions. It's just this list of just some types of records that. Uh, we'd be interested in, we, and um, you know, so like we collect photographs, VHS, meeting minutes, flyers, and more. Um, essentially, we want material that captures the daily or personal, professional or volunteer community activities of Muslims, their families, and Muslim organizations. And this past year, uh, we focused a lot on uh, trying to find uh, and identify who might have these kinds of records and who are willing to part with them. Uh, we've done this through our outreach strategy in kind of two ways. So the past year we've conducted a number of webinars in order to highlight our community archival initiative, um, in, in order to highlight our community archive, but as well as other community archival initiatives and um, initiatives especially that are also preserving or documenting Muslim histories. Um, secondly, we've also used the media to find uh, records uh, donors. Um, I've been interviewed by newspapers like the Toronto Star in order to spread the word of MICA and find donors. And I've also been on a podcast and wrote for Black Flash, uh, Black Flash Magazine to get um, MICA out there as well. Um, and I think we have a list. Yeah, so this is a list of uh, some of the webinars we've done. Um, this is a series that we've called the Community Collaboration Learning Series. Uh, as you can see, we've done some book talks uh, with, uh, with uh, Murray Hockbin, uh, Ishmael Mukhtar, and we've learned a lot about community practices of the Shinwak Residential School Center. We talked to Professor Aditi Mehta as well um, about mixed media storytelling with Muslim youth in Regent Park. 
and um, we heard from the Egypt Migrations Oral History Project that just is this just to name a few. Um, these are all on our YouTube page if they were all recorded, so you can always watch them if you'd like. Um, oops. Yes, and um, these are just some screenshots of some of the media outlets uh, we've been featured in. Uh, again, these can be found online very easily as well. Um, and uh, of course, uh, this, despite all these uh, strategies, the, the best way to always reach anyone is by word of mouth. So uh, once we know one person is interested, they a lot of times we've been very grateful that they were able to uh, spread the word of, of MICA in their own communities. And, um, and a lot of times I meet people uh, through that. Um, because of our outreach strategy, we were able to secure three uh, donations of records this past year. Two of the three donors are here today, and we're really, really grateful uh, to have them say a few words later on as well. So on the note of records donations, I wanted to focus today a little bit on um, illustrating how we have set up our donation process or processes, I guess, because it always looks very different for everyone we've talked to so far. Uh, the records donation process is all about building a relationship with a potential donor, earning trust and ensuring uh, transparency. Um, depending on how you find us or how we find you or how we talk to, how we connect with you, typically we start with uh, the expression of interest form, which is on our website. Um, oh, this is all, also all to say that anybody can be a records donor. I think I should preface with that. Um, anybody could fill out this expression of interest form if you have anything that you're interested in donating to us or you think might be of value. So the form is, is especially uh, important uh, for those who, um, I guess, we haven't met yet or have or and have uh, records that they wish to donate. And it lets me understand kind of briefly what kind of records you have in your possession. We also have um, a self-assessment form, which potential donors typically fill out as well. This form is a little bit more detailed than the previous one, asks more specific questions and allows the donor to kind of reflect more deeply um, on the material, material they'd like to donate or, or not donate as well. Um, we also uh, try to have at least one or more site visits. So this typically happens uh, after one of the one of these forms are filled out where I believe maybe our um, your records fit our mandate and we'd like them and uh, we have capacity for um, taking care of them basically. So I'll essentially come in and take a look at what we have personally. During COVID, unfortunately, this has been through many Zoom chats. Um, and uh, but we have done at only one so far physical site visit as well, uh, which we've been lucky to do um, during like a low, a low period. Um, some of our so this is all just to say that you know some of our donors have filled out every form I've ever created and some only have done one or two or some have filled out like neither and we've only had direct sort of zoom conversations. Um, some and I've also have, some of them again I haven't done physical site visits, you know, and that's fine. Um, some people have contacted us and some we've reached out to and it, it's just it always just depends on the person and we, we do our best to try to adapt to everybody everybody that wants to donate their records to us. I learned that we have to be adaptable and flexible, you know, to the needs of the individual and uh, what works for you as the records donor. In the end, though. Um, every official donor will be asked to sign a deed of gift. This is when the material is kind of legally transferred to us at MICA, specifically to uh, U of T because we are in U of T, uh, University of Toronto. Um, and it may seem a little bit intimidating, but we've worked really hard with uh, we've worked really hard to ensure the agreement provides as many avenues as possible to allow the donor donor to have control um, of how we take care of their records. And um, a really important point I want to make as well is that throughout this the entire donation process, we're always here, I'm always here to have as many conversations as possible with you in order to understand you, your stories, answer any questions, and better, better understand the records that you want to donate to us. Uh, we never want you to feel like we're going to come in and kind of take your stuff and leave and never talk to you again. Um, we want to ensure you're part of the entire process and actually we'll give uh, an example of a of um, a process with one of our own donations and just in a few minutes. Yes, so 
um, the power of the donor is very, very important to us. And um, I really want to kind of take a moment to, to talk about this, especially uh, because um, as a, as a records donor, sometimes one of the things we, we come across is, uh, sorry, as, a, as an archivist, some of, one of the things I come across is um, uh, people that uh, get, get worried about uh, how much control they'll, ha they'll have over their records. And um, so we try to make sure people have that control through the deed of gift. And the deed of gift kind of formally, trans so it trans formally transfer transfers your ownership um, uh, to us. Uh, but we have some measures in place. Um, so, for example, uh, you're able to have restrictions on your material. So, if you kind of say, like, you know, I want this binder of, st of stuff to be restricted, and nobody can see it until I die, we'll make sure that happens. Um, or if you don't, maybe you say that you don't want certain family members to see this specific grouping of photos. Um, you have absolutely the power to tell us to do that, and we'll make sure that that restriction is set in place. Um, you also have the power to tell us what you don't want digitized. So maybe you'd prefer the audience of your records to be exclusively those that physically come to MICA, to our facility, and see your records, as opposed to the whole kind of wide, wide world through the internet. You can let us know and we can add any of these kinds of provisions for you through that official kind of uh, deed of gift. Another way we can ensure your security is just kind of the mere uh, reality of an archive. It's not a library, so nobody can um, kind of come and look at your material and take it and take it home with them. Um, they have to do their work um, at the site right then and there. And um, that, that just ensures that the archivist is there and making sure that they're taking care of, uh, their, of the material that they're handling. And finally, I want to talk about the impressions element. Um, this part of your kind of final organized collection at MICA allow, allows you to speak about your records in your own words. So while I, as the archivist, I will end up writing kind of a description or catalog record of your collection at MICA, a very official looking one, your impressions um, will also be included in that, in that kind of catalog rec record. So people can see or hear what you want to say regarding your donation. So this can look like a video recording, an audio recording, written statement, a poem, kind of anything. Um, and when, we want to make sure that, that besides the professional catalog of uh, your donated collection, uh, your words also stand out as well. And the context and the richness of your records um, uh, come out through your own words. OK, so with that, I'd like to now talk a little bit about some of our um, first donations. And then you know walk you through what we've done so far with one of them. Um, ah, so some photos. So our very first donation is by uh, Dr. Catherine Bullock, and we have some photos here of her donations, uh, of her donation of records. We received a number of boxes in her donation. Um, spent a few weeks organizing them, organizing them using standard archival principles. Um, and they're now in like nice acid free folders and inside um, about seven to eight archival boxes. So on uh, the left at the bottom left, uh, those are the archival boxes. Uh, some notable records uh, was her amazing collection of Islamic restaurants or restaurants that serve halal foods in and around the GTA. Um, so she collected a lot of uh, flyers from those restaurants. And uh, we also have a wonderful collection of uh, journal issues from the American, American Journal of Islamic Social Sciences as well. Um, once myself and Emily um, had a chance to look at everything in her donation, we organized them and began creating a finding aid. So a finding aid is, like I mentioned before, kind of like a library books uh, catalog record. Uh, this aid will help any user that comes into MICA understand what is in uh, Dr. Bullock's collection. Um, so, okay, so the, this find so this finding aid is uh, one of many final products of a donated collection of records. So, as you can see here, there are some screenshots on the screen. Um, at, um, this is these are just pieces of Dr. Bullock's final kind of finding aid. The top shows a spreadsheet of the folders within uh, specifically box two of Dr. Book's collection and our descriptions of each folder. So the in the bottom is a draft biography that I'm working on still in order to capture kind of the full breadth of her life and 
um, for each biographical sketch, I hope to kind of go back and forth with each donor to make sure they're comfortable with the way the biography represents them. Um, in the end, we'll attempt to describe each folder in the collection and, uh, and with the combined biography, uh, we'll be able to post them online on our online database for anyone uh, to discover. So they would be able to see the finding aid, understand what's in her collection, and maybe um, connect with us to be able to see a folder or two. And I will talk more about the online database in a few minutes. Uh, the next two photos are from our second and third donors. Um, as you can see, we have some retirement congratulatory cards on the left, um, an astrological chart uh, on the right, and a poem written to the donor as well in the right picture as well. Uh, the next photo shows uh, some newsletters from the 1990s on the left. Um, this newsletter was the Al-Bashir, sorry, I was turning my head, the Al-Bashir uh, uh, newsletter. And on the right, we have some newspapers as well. I think that was from 2001, yeah. And these are just some really great examples of the stuff you can donate to MICA. And we're, you know, we're still slowly processing what we do have, and we're forever, forever grateful uh, to our first donors for trusting us to be their, the repository of their records. Okay, so speaking of our first donors, we have two of them today, and they've agreed to speak for a little bit about their experience uh, donating to MICA um, and kind of why they did it. So. Without further ado, I'd like to pass things off to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Catherine Bullock. Thank you, Mosca, for that inch lovely introduction. You, you uh, talked about me collecting restaurant flyers, which is kind of hilarious because I almost never eat out. But uh, the reason I did that is part of the reason that I was collecting all of these documents, because I know that it just represents a snapshot of the Muslim community at a certain time and place. And I've been a historian all my life. I, know, I don't know how I ended up in political science, but I really feel the, the value of history. We are who we are today because of where we came from, as uh, um, Anva said at the beginning. And... Ever since I became Muslim, I, in the back of my mind, I guess maybe even subconsciously, I have been collecting things. I've been waiting for your archive for the last 20 years. I collected anything that I knew provided a snapshot of the community as it was at that time. I'm, I don't have to go through everything. You've seen the restaurant flyers, but you know, newsletters, newspapers, um, political candidate flyers, minutes of organizations, conference size programs. I mean, a whole set of things. If I try to explain why I care, have cared about that, uh, and it's because we plot what's called political history. That's, you know, sort of like what the politicians were doing and wars and things. But to understand what it was like for people, this is something called social history. And how do we know what it was like for people in the past, like in the 1800s, like we know about a little bit about life. It's because of what they've left behind, the archives, their archives. And something seems irrelevant now, like uh, you take a movie ticket now. It seems like, okay, yeah, I'll toss that. But in like 100 years, that becomes a thing of wonder. It cost $15 to go to the movie. They were showing this kind of movie. They had this color. They had this kind of seating available. And maybe movie theaters won't even exist in like a hundred years. So it becomes a thing of wonder. I find all of these documents, they, they, they start out as sort of ordinary, quotidian, maybe irrelevant, and finally they become things of wonder. This is what it was like for people back then. So as you alluded to in your introduction, Muslims um, are maligned in the mainstream media and often in academia too, although of course that's changing. And in the general population, we still face street harassment when we go out because of the narratives about us, which don't capture who we really are as a people. I think that the archive, the, sh the snapshots that we can provide, the, the family photos, although I admit I haven't been brave enough to submit any family photos yet, but the family photos, who, who are we as a people? What were our lives like, our successes, our challenges? our loves, our joys, our contributions to Canada. We, we are helping make Canada and we've been helping make Canada for a couple of hundred years. But if you want to know about the early Muslims, maybe the black Muslims who came in the 1800 as slaves or 
the early Muslims who came out from Scotland in the 1800s, like we know almost nothing about them because there's, there's not that much left behind. So this project, I am so happy it exists. I'm so happy to contribute because we will begin this narrative of collecting and archiving so that people can come and find out about us. Thank you for giving me the chance to, to comment. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and next, we I'd like to call on um, Muneeb Nasser. Um, thank you for also for being here, um, with us today and agreeing to say a few words. Uh, thank you, uh, Moska, and uh, Salaam Alaikum. Uh, let me first, um, you know, begin by thanking Micah and the Islamic uh, uh, Institute Institute of Islamic Studies um, for this uh, important project that collects, uh, you know, and preserves our heritage and our memories of the Canadian Muslim community. You know, I concur with what is, uh, I think Anwar said this, that, you know, failing to preserve our heritage in many ways threatens the, the health of our community. Uh, if you don't know what happened in the past, you know, we can't make sense of the present. So I think this is quite an important uh, project and initiative. You know, uh, over the years, I have been writing a lot uh, in the Muslim community. Um, since my early days in the mosque, I was part of producing magazines and newsletters, um, and I still continue to do that digitally. So I, you know, over the years, I, at some point I knew that I needed to sort of donate these materials um, to some uh, institution. And quite a few years ago, I, you know, attended a presentation of the Ontario Archives. And I had the intention of, um, at the time, of donating some of these records to the Ontario Archives until I stumbled across Micah um, about a year and a half ago. And I sent in this um, you know, request um, that I was interested in donating uh, the material that I had um, you know, to this uh, project. Uh, the material I, I donated um, you know, is uh, quite interesting in the sense that two of the magazines came out of the two mosques that um, you know, were from the lineage of the first mosque. This is the Jami Mosque and the Islamic Foundation. Um, and these two mosques you know, were uh, basically established by the members and families that came out of the first mosque. So the uh, magazines, the first was the Anur that came out of the Jami Mosque. And it captures uh, you know, the 1980s in the Jami Mosque. And the Al-Bashir came in the 1990s from the Islamic Foundation. And um, you know, both of these institutions have played a major role in the history of the Toronto Muslim community, the GTA Muslim community. And um, you know, it served as a platform as well for budding writers. And I was looking back at some of the editions um, of the, both Anur and Al-Bashir and some of our current authors came from, uh, came, had their sort of first uh, um, experience writing in these magazines. So some of the um, uh, Muslims who have become quite well known now um, in terms of authors, uh, Ruksana Khan, Uzma Jalaluddin, um, SK Ali, all of them wrote in these two magazines. Um, so it's quite a, a history here. The, the third uh, donation was Imprint, which came in the early 2000s. Actually, it was published the, the month after 9-11. That's when the publication started. So it captures that period um, of the Muslim community when we were sort of navigating our, our identity. You know, we are moving from being Muslims in Canada to uh, considering ourselves Canadian Muslims. So you can see that in this uh, three-year publication of the Imprint. Um, so the, all, all three uh, donations sort of captures, uh, it's a snapshot of the history of the uh, GTA uh, Muslim community. And, um, you know, they encourage others who have records in their possession. Um, some of them may be earlier than the 1980s um, that we are missing. I, I think those are quite important uh, to document um, in, the, um, in the Muslim community. So uh, once again, I thank Micah and the Institute of Islamic Studies for this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both. Uh, again, uh, I mean, 
we would really wouldn't be an archive without our donors. So uh, we were so very, very, very grateful for your donations. Um, we have a lot of processing still to do, um, but uh, we're, 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 we're getting there. <laughs> um, so then the next thing that I wanted to talk about is just some of the stuff we're doing you now, aside from the, the number of boxes of donations that we have that I've been working on, I've been proce we've been processing, um, uh, we're also doing some other things on the side as well to make sure that um, Micah, um, um, uh, Micah's goals are met, and, and that includes um, our digital space. So we are trying to, we're trying our best to um, uh, figure out what Micah's online platform will look like because we, again, we're, we're trying to be a national, kind of a national um, archive for Muslims in Canada. Um, and uh, Hassan couldn't be here today, and he is he is Micah's digital fellow, so he is in charge of, um, you know, developing our online platforms. But he did send us a video, um, and he just has a few things to say about what we're what we're working on. And then, uh, so I'm gonna play it, and then please uh, let me know if we can't hear it or not. Hello everyone, my name is Hassan and I'm working as a digital fellow for Muslims in Canada archives. I'm also a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Information studying Muslim digital media archives in South Asia. At MICA, we are currently working on developing a server space and digital archival environment for MICA's back end processes. We have developed our workflows and are in the process of materializing these uh, setups uh, for the archival repository and front-end access point via a user-friendly website. Our main considerations during this process is to take into account effective storage and retrieval of Muslim archival materials. Hence, the digital and physical infrastructure is being put into place will take into account ethical proprietary and security concerns for deposited Muslim archival materials. We hope that you find Micah's work of benefit to you and your community. So, um... Essentially, what we are kind of working on then um, in the in the background, aside from processing material, is um, Micah's kind of portal. So we have, uh, I have here like a, a slide that I hope does does kind of visualize it as best as, as best as I can as best as it can. But essentially, we uh, our plan is to have a, a website uh, that will be the main portal. Um, and from that website, uh, you can you'll be able to go to kind of two kind of two or three um, different uh, areas. So one would be the digital description database. So um, like I showed earlier with uh, Dr. Bullock's uh, material, um, we have you know there's a we we'll would be creating a finding aid eventually, and this is a, this is a document or a catalog record that's called a, a description of the collection. And we'll have a database with all those descriptions, um, and that will be accessible uh, for the public from the main Micah page. Um, this database is the is the kind of the big one. Um, it it hopes to be, um, it hopes to kind of pull from all the uh, partner institutions from across the province. So, like I mentioned before, we have um, you know a relationship with. At the Memorial University, as well as uh, University of Laval, and we're hoping to go to other provinces as well. And each province is meant to kind of document its own Muslims in its own province. And um, as we receive uh, finding aid descriptions, you know, those catalog records um, from the different uh, provinces, they kind of will, will all can centralize into this description database. So if anybody wants to uh, look at any material specific to a certain province, you, know, you can search, you'll be able to search like that if you'd like. Um, the other aspect is this digital, digital collection. So there are material that we will uh, digitize or are already digital that we hope to be able to put onto the digital collections portion of the website. So if there's a you know a, a, an album of photographs that we receive, um, maybe in, and uh, we digitize it, we'll be able to put it into uh, the digital collections section so someone can kind of digitally flip through the the album and uh, learn more about the photos and learn more um, about the donor as well because. And we're hoping that the, the digital collections will also uh, tie into the description database as well. So 
if you see a photograph that you really like on the digital collection side, because I know a lot, a lot of people enjoy, um, you know, looking at you know, virtual exhibits of museum artifacts and things like that. If you can imagine it's something similar, you see a photo you really like, and you'd like to read more about the uh, the the creator of that photo or the donor of that photo. Um, there'll easily be like a link, and you can go to maybe the description database that describes that uh, that donor or that creator. And then kind of jetting off uh, of the digital collections is the exhibit site. So um, this is a uh, this will these will be temporary websites, uh, temporary kind of portals within the digital collections where we kind of thematically um, host exhibits. So maybe um, in the future we'll just have a, a, an exhibit of just photographs of. Uh, Muslims in Nova Scotia or something like that. And I'll be just one specific thematic um, um, exhibit and we'll pull from all the donations that we have, anything that related to Nova Scotian Muslims, for example. And um, and of course, those will be uh, uh, those will have, you know, uh, digital uh, objects or digital photographs and um, and they'll be able to tell a story related to that specific theme. So these are our goals and um, oh, the next slide actually shows our current website. So um, the Muslims in Canada archives, the link is at the top. Uh, and it's also in the chat now. Thank you, Emily. Um, but this is our current website. Um, as you can see, there is a section for collections. Um, it, it doesn't lead anywhere just yet because we have to, we're still, like Hassan said, we're still working on um, making sure that we have um, that back end set up first and, and then we'll be able to uh, use a certain you know proprietary some certain softwares to be able to have um, a nice a nice uh, collections website digital collections website um, but this uh, so this will we're hoping that this kind of website will be the portal which will lead you into the digital collections which will lead you into the descriptions and into the exhibits as well uh, you can go here now if you'd like to um, check out uh, some of the other uh, YouTube videos that we have, uh, sorry, sorry, the other webinars that are on our YouTube channel, there are links for that. Um, there's uh, links to all those, uh, you know, interviews, uh, uh, podcasts that I've, I've done as well about Micah. You can learn more about how you can contribute your records or donate your records to us. Uh, there's a link under contribute. And you can also learn how you can donate uh, financially to us as well to support Micah. Okay, so now um, I'd like to uh, call on Anver, who will be talking a little bit about uh, fundraising. Um, I hate to, this is the part that I always hate doing because, um, you know, this is, this is a large, because it's all one of the things that I've really valued about the Institute is that our job is to produce research that people use. Uh, and, and that's usually an internalized cost that we usually manage. But the archive is one of the projects, um, and it's it's the project that's closest to my heart. But it's what we call a marquee project because this is not it's not really a project; it's an institution. What we're building is an institution that will withstand the test of time. And so, part of what and and it's an institution that we know is necessary because, um, at least with respect to Islamophobia, I don't think anyone believes that we can combat. There's no magic bullet. There's no single switch that will turn it off. Um, we want to combat it one story at a time. And so the idea then is to be able to take time, to have the time, to have the infrastructure, to collect, to describe, and to exhibit, and by exhibiting, featuring those stories. It's a, But it's a project that requires a vast amount of human resources, as you can tell from the team. An archivist, students who support our archivist, digital platforms, digital stewards who manage those platforms. And of course, as technology changes, the constant evolution around security and securitizing our digital port, our digital portfolios. And so there's two different streams of funding that we're trying to pursue. And we want to, we're hoping to, to, to seek the support of the larger communities and, and stakeholder communities around Canada to make this a distinctively Canadian archive. Um, one that leverages the institutional Heft of the university, where we have libraries, where we have access, where we have climate control, but also then allows us to hire the right um, the right people to run it. It is, in a sense, a small economy to manage. If I could have the next slide, so we are structuring this um, 
uh, around two different models. One is an endowment and one is an expendable fund. The endowment model, for any of you familiar with medieval Islamic law, you might find this familiar. This is like the medieval waqf, but it's structured as an endowment with uh, which will then allow for us to structure our project and maintain MICA in perpetuity. That's the key. Um, it needs to survive me, needs to survive Mosca, Hassan, Emily, all of us need to, and, and in many ways, by the endowment is a mark that the archive is not for us. It's perhaps maybe holds stuff that's dear to us, but it's really for the generations that come after. And so that's the key element that we're looking towards. And that's one of our, our business model approaches. Um, MICA is the only endowment project we have at the Institute in large part because um, no matter what we do, we will be use, utilizing the, the infrastructure of the university. And so the endowment will support both of that. But at the same time, and this is more on those exhibit pages that Mosca shared with you, is we recognize that as times change, the need for storytelling will change too. Um, you know, one of the things that's really come to my mind is we need to retell the story of refugees. After hearing all the news accounts around Ukrainian refugees and undesirable refugees, maybe we need to rethink what that story is. And given Somali Muslims, Afghan Muslims, Syrian Muslims, many of who live here in Canada as refugees, they offer an opportunity for us to, to uniquely feature the story of the refugee as part of MICA. Next year, the story might be different. And the, the year after that, the story might be different. The expendable fund is really about allowing us to, to, to think about, develop, and curate those storytelling platforms that then you use in your materials, you use in your institutional settings with your media context for your reading, writing, and research for purposes. We're not here to necessarily tell the story, though we're happy to curate various kinds of stories, but we also know that these stories need to have lives of their own. They need to come through and they need, they need people to help tell the stories and curate the stories. As you can tell, all of the, all of the funding that we do, uh, that we look to is really about maximizing the efficacy of the, of the institution while at the same time ensuring its, its, uh, its perpetuity. And so you might see us in the coming months, um, uh, you might see more information around MICA as we begin thinking more robustly around a fundraising campaign uh, for MICA, because this is, uh, this is a large endeavor, uh, one that we think is well-suited for a university like the U of T to undertake, uh, one where we think we can manage financially the costs in this manner, and one that also allows us to show accountability to the larger community. And so um, it's my hope that we'll be able to be successful uh, in this. And, uh, and, and it's, it's my intention that we begin this. It's my intention going into Ramadan that, uh, that this become a, a, a key feature of what we'll be doing going forward. So. Thanks, Amber. Um, so I, I wanted to also, um, you know, before we get to some of our amazing speakers, um, I wanted to touch on some of the uh, things we've learned um, from interacting with uh, the Canadian Muslim community, you know, uh, potential records donors, you know, all of you who are um, interested in donating records and some of the challenges we face and how we're addressing them. So, you know, kind of, uh, first of all, um, we saw some, some hesitation from people um, regarding kind of the formality and the legal aspects of the deed of gift, especially the, 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 the kind of official transfer to us. And of course we get it, like it's this, uh, this legal document and there's a lot of la language that may not be understandable and, um, and it looks daunting, but, you know, as we I kind of mentioned before earlier, you know, we've done our best sort of to make sure that you as the donor, um, you know, has as much control over, uh, you know, how we take care of your records as possible. Um, you know, you're able to tell us what you don't want to be, you know, what you want to, uh, restricted and how for how long and um, and we'll do our and of course we're, we're obligated to do what you do what you uh, um, state in the deed of gift. Um, so secondly, we also noticed um, that, you know, and Enver touched on this really uh, earlier, but we noticed that, you know, newcomers, you know, and, you know Enver mentioned refugees, you know, they may not easily uh, donate to MICA, and that's absolutely understandable. Um, uh, newcomer Muslims often have very little with them and when they arrive here, and, and what they do have is often very, very precious or priceless to them. Um, uh, this is a harder one to 
uh, kind of address, but we are we will be trying to work on some kind of oral history project, maybe in the future, um, you know, so that you know people that don't want to donate physical material can still donate their stories. Uh, we've also uh, another bigger big one is uh, people that you know. You know, Muslims who very understandably don't trust us because we're part of U of T, a kind of major public institution. Um, and and to, the, to those folks, I, I think I absolutely understand. And uh, we try our best to, you know, if, they, if it's not U of T, um, you know, as long as Muslims are recorded somewhere, well, I try my best to maybe um, find homes for their records elsewhere. So I have a lot of connections to uh, archives, you know, at the provincial, municipal, even like smaller community levels, um, even and national as well. Um, and I am more than happy to find uh, um, another rep repository that might fit you better and you, you'd prefer. And, you know, some people especially try to, um, you know, donate and do want to donate their, their records closer to home. Uh, so, you know, if, if uh, U of T is too far away for you, and that's absolutely understandable, we can find, uh, we can find a home for your record somewhere else. Um, and uh, the, the last one that what's, you know, says all or nothing, um, some people also believe that, um, you know, when, when they have to, when I ask for their stuff, they have to give me all of it. And I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that, you know, again, as a donor, you have absolute control over what you uh, donate to an archive, not just my guide to any archive. It's up to you what you choose to donate, and it's up to you what you don't want to donate to us. If you and, and that ties into some of the um, the list on, under the cultural perspective section. You know, some people, uh, you know, you know, they might be too embarrassed for certain things to be donated or to to Micah, for example, or to an archive. And and um, to that, I just say, don't give it. Then don't 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 donate it. Then you know, just you don't have to donate every single thing in your library or in your in your basement or in, in your boxes. It's up to you. Um, you know, it's up to you, and uh, it's up to you also what kind of representation you'd like to have in the archives as well. So. Um, I will take whatever you're comfortable with, and I and you know any archive will take what you're comfortable with. We're comfortable with. We we don't want to. Um, we're not here to to take everything. Um, yeah, so some of the things, yeah. So like as I stated on the slide, you know some of the things we've heard from people is that you know they believe they're not, um, you know them themselves are not important enough to be recorded in in an archive in an archive or be part of Canadian Muslim history in, or, or, or or whatnot and I think um, Dr. Bullock said it well earlier that you know it's those uh, you know it's those smaller um, history not smaller but the, you know the histories of like the common folk that we don't get to hear uh, very much because they're not in the archive and they're not their their material is not um, uh, is, uh, is not preserved um, you know, the social histories, so those are the ones that we don't get to hear and um, the humility um, aspect of it, I, I absolutely understand and we, we get a lot from uh, the people I talk to and I try my best to tell them that, you know, and tell you all also that um, everyone's important and all their material is important for, uh, for capturing Canadian uh, Muslim history. It won't be Canadian Muslim history if it's just uh, it's if it's just the I guess the high profile people like you know everybody that self identifies as a Canadian Muslim can be part of MICA. I think we can move on now just I'm just watching the time a little bit to some of our invited guests. Um, we have some wonderful wonderful supporters of MICA who've been there since since the beginning. Um, and we have asked them to come and speak a little bit about uh, you know why they support MICA and uh, I. Our first uh, speaker is actually a video <laughs> because so Har Harun Siddiqui is, has been a supporter of MICA for a very, very long time. And um, he's a former columnist and national editor with the Toronto Star, uh, where he retired actually as an edit as editorial uh, page um, editor. And he uh, couldn't be here today, but he um, he was he, we did have a conversation over Zoom not too long ago, which we um, actually recorded, and he wanted uh, to submit that uh, video um, as his um, few words for today. So I'm going to play that. Um, I think it is. Is it playing? No. Okay. 
archives are important because we are a relatively new community in Canada or a relatively small minority. Uh, we don't have 3,000 years of history in Canada, but nobody does. But uh, Muslim presence in Canada does date, date back almost to 1867, um, the British North America Act uh, in 1871 or something like that. Uh, there's a record of Muslims being present. Um, then uh, they remain small. The first Muslims coming from Lebanon and places like that. Then others came from India and Pakistan. But we do not fully have a good recorded history. I mean, historians have written about it, but we don't have things, uh, documents, uh, uh, pieces of history. Um, and that is why this is an extraordinarily important project. And I'm glad that the Institute of Islamic Studies has started this in a systematic way, because that is a way we tell our story. We tell the story of Muslims in Canada, just like Ukrainians and Polish people and others have done so. Being a minority, we remain and our history and our record remains neglected. Um, this is not a conspiracy theory. It's a nature of being a minority in a new place. Um, we are pioneers in that sense. And therefore, it is very important to have such an institute and such an archives. Then the question becomes, what can we do as individuals to record it? I mean, we have some histories. You know, we know, for example, uh, the first mosque is in Edmonton, 1938. Uh, the first Muslims to... Winnipeg, I know, went in early 1900s and so on. Um, uh, but uh, other parts of the country, we don't have such history, such recorded history. So we need to know uh, what we can do. So what can individuals today do, for example? Do we have ancestors of people who came at the turn of the century? Uh, do we have people uh, who were present when the mosque in Edmonton was inaugurated by Sheikh Yusuf in 1938. Um, were uh, in Manitoba, are there people in, in, in Winnipeg who were present when the first mosque was opened in, uh, in, 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 in Winnipeg? And you duplicate that for every community across the country. So uh, that is of ancestors who were here before. What about the more recent immigrants? Uh, we bring our history with us. I brought my history from Hyderabad, India, for example. Um, and I grew up during the Nizam's Hyderabad, which was a kingdom. And then he lost his kingdom in 1948. And what I remember as a child is in every household, or just about every household, there was a library. Um, there were ink pots and paper and pen and the value of, uh, of, 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 of reading and the value of Islamic books or non-Islamic books and so on. And then in the 1950s, when Muslims lost uh, a great deal of uh, uh, their treasure and their wealth, uh, the libraries were the first victims of that. And I remember as a child uh, that books were sold for their leather bindings. They were, their value was found to be in leather bindings, not in what was in the books. And I carry a scar from that uh, because having grown up like that, and it's all lost. Um, so we do not want such, such things to happen again. We are blessed in this country that we are able to preserve things and so on. So whatever records you may have uh, that may be of value, um, and you would, you should consider donating it to the archives. Uh, that does not mean that they'll come and take everything away from you. Uh, you have a discussion with them. You have a discussion with Moscow and say, here is what I have. Is this of any value to you? And she will give you a professional judgment and say, no, this is junk. Uh, she will not say it like that, but, <laughs> uh, but this is useful. Or that uh, at some future time, you may not want to donate it now, but you can donate it later. Uh, what are the things to remember? The things to remember, this is not a junkyard. You don't want to just get rid of your things. Okay, let's give it to the archive. No, this is like giving clothes to the poor. Uh, it's a bad example, but that's the same thing. You don't want to just dump everything. There. You, want to, you have to make an effort to assess it yourself. Why is it important to you? Why would it be important to anyone else? 
what makes it exciting? What makes it exciting? You are the first Muslim in Makarawa and the reserve in Northern Africa. I say that in my brother Yusuf was the first Muslim there. They had never heard of a Muslim. They did not know about Muslim. Uh, his, his experience was, 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 was pioneer, unique. unique. I don't say it's a, a brother, brother, but it, 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 it's, it's interesting, you see. The, 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 the many people have never heard of a Muslim, they have not heard of the word Islam, they have not seen a Muslim. And then he tells the stories of how uh, in such an isolated place, most people ended up uh, drunk. Uh, what did Yusuf do? Yusuf sat down and uh, made sure that his memorization of the Quran was good. So he kept reading his Quran. Uh, there you go. I mean, that's a story. That's a good story to tell. Similarly, you will have stories like that. You are the first Muslim somewhere, or your community had the first mosque built in so and so. Uh, you recall your first Ramadan or first Eid celebration. There's a picture of the family at a picnic that was the Eid picnic. The things of that nature that place you in a context on Canadian soil. That is what's it makes it interesting but anyway you and i don't have to judge it there's a professional in in moscow and she will guide you as to what makes it interesting what does not make it interesting what else do you want to know um i think my next uh, uh question i think what would be interesting for people um would be like my own uh relationship with you and your records as well um because you didn't end up donating your records to us, but um, I was still involved in your the donation yes. of your records. Somewhere. What people also need to know is that um, Micah is not going to be possessive of your records. If they think, for example, that your records would be better off with the Ontario Historical Society or equivalent historical societies across the provinces in Canada, um, in Toronto, there's the uh, Matthew Fish, Fisher Rare Library uh, Books in, 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 at the U of T. There is another uh, library, uh, another uh, archives at the Unis York University. Similarly, there is no shortage of archives across the country. Uh, she may be able to direct you saying, uh, you are better off there, uh, which is what she did with me. She said, you know, your archives may be better off at the National Archives of Canada. And I'm grateful to her for guiding me how to do it. And she put me in touch with them. In the end, I may uh, leave uh, the relevant parts to the to MICA and the rest of them can go to the National Archives. Similarly, in your case, in your city, there's generally an archives, in your province, there's an archives, your universities have archives. So uh, do not be hesitant to, to communicate that to Micah and say, look, I live in PI. This is where I've spent all 40 years. I would like to donate it to PI records or whatever, but she'll guide you to it. You know, uh, in that sense, you ought not to feel that you're obligated to just give it to Micah, but it helps the process in overall building of Muslim history and a record of that in Canada. And hopefully someday, this is my dream, that uh, Moscow and uh, Anwar Iman and the Institute would put up an exhibition, for example, of rare whatever from 1938 or, or 51, or the first people from the Levant had come to Halifax and PEI uh, at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, things like that. There's value to these things, and we need to start thinking like that. That was actually my next question and um, I relate to what do you think the the future of MICA can look like and uh, what do you think oh, the possibilities can I be? Mean, in, I am hoping that in five or ten years time you will have enough records of enough Muslims to be then able to tell a story. Uh, and what is the story? Story is when did they come? Historians, as I said, have written it, but probably we can make a documentary out of it. Uh, by taking photographs and videos of the things that people have donated. That's one. Secondly, um, uh, what were the challenges that they faced? What was the kind of racism that they faced? We know, for example, that the Sikhs in British Columbia faced a lot of racism. South Asians faced a lot of racism. Muslims faced a lot of racism because of uh, not so much that they were Muslim, but because they were Asian or whatever. Um, 
uh, and then in, when you get to the modern times, uh, it would help counter the distortions that have been introduced into the public domain because of post 9-11 Islamophobia, the like of which we have not seen in this country. I always say, you know, Islamophobia is just the flip coin of anti-Semitism. Uh, and you, when you do polls and so on, say, who are the people you hate the most? You know, number one, Muslims. Uh, who is number two by the uh, Jews, you know? So these two Semitic cousins uh, are the recipient of the most hate in this country, as they are in Europe and elsewhere. So um, we need to record this. We need to not only record it, but we need to counter it. Um, the doctor who, who serves in, uh, in a small town in Nova Scotia and has provided health care to a whole generation of people, um, he doesn't look like a terrorist. He doesn't look like a jihadist. He doesn't look like a radical. He doesn't look like a fundamentalist, quote unquote, Muslim. You know, all these labels that have been put on it. Um, people, living, living, breathing people are proof of all the nonsense that has been propagated about Muslims. So if you can tell that story through your records, tell your story through your pictures, your family, and your great contributions to this country, um, it is in the interest of Muslims and it's the interest of all Canadians. You know, Canada is only as strong as its various small components are strong and dignified and confident and assertive of their identity and who they are. You know, this is my personal thing. One of the saddest things that has happened in post 9-11 era is that it has put Muslims, a lot of Muslims on the defensive. I'm a Muslim, but I'm not a Khomeini Muslim. I mean, who asked you that, you know? I'm a Muslim, but I'm not a fundamentalist Muslim. Um, does a Christian feel the need to say I'm a Christian, but not a Jerry Falwell Christian, for example, you know, or all the other crazies, or I'm a, I'm a Jew, but not I'm not a Jewish Defense League Jew. On and on it goes. So this this kind of defensiveness that has crept into Muslim psychology and Muslim DNA, which is incredibly bad for our children and the young people, uh, we need to counter it. And this is one way of doing it. Okay, so um, so that was Harun Siddiqui. We also have um, another uh, person who couldn't make it today, but did also send a video um, Arif Farani, who is Member of Parliament for Parkdale High Park, had a few things to say as well. Um, this will be, I promise this will be the last video. Goes to the next one. Okay, great. Micah, the Muslims in Canada Archive, is critical. It's a critical project whose time has come. Why is it needed? It's needed to combat the Islamophobia that is all around us. We know that extremism, hatred, acts of violence are being perpetrated against so many communities, particularly Muslims in Canada right now. Unfortunately, this has not abated. One of the ways that we can correct this and end this hatred is by changing the narrative. That's what Micah will now enable us to do, by empowering Muslims to tell their own stories, portray themselves in a positive light, and not be subjected to negative stereotypes that are perpetuated in common parlance, in the narratives, in the media, etc. We can overcome a lot of that stereotyping. What do I mean by this? Micah will enable us to tell the stories of people like the Persian architects who helped to build the CN Tower. It will enable us to tell the stories of Ugandan Asian Muslims like my family that came here fleeing Idi Amin in 1972. It will enable us to tell the stories of Syrian refugees who came to this country five years ago and are now uh, successful entrepreneurs in places like Nova Scotia where they run entities like Death by Chocolate. Those are the kinds of stories we need to be available in Canada, we need to tell in Canada. Why is this important? It's important to me as a parliamentarian, it's important to Muslims like me around this country, but it's also important for my children and for their children. Islamophobia is not going to disappear overnight, it's going to take time to eradicate this. But by telling these stories and promoting this new narrative, Micah will help us to achieve that task. Okay, so um, those are the last two videos of some of our supporters. 
Um, next, uh, we, have the, uh, we have some speakers who are here with us today. I wanted to start off with um, Sadia Zaman. So uh, Sadia is the current CEO of Inspirit Foundation and of one of Micah's um, awesome supporters. I think I will stop sharing just so we can um, be able to see everyone. Okay. Take it away, Sadia. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really, really fascinating hearing um, the process, the thinking behind the archive. Um, one of the things I'm really struck by is um, the focus on narrative and the importance of narrative power and the shifting of that power. And one, way, one of the ways we shift narrative power within all sorts of systems within this country is by providing a more complete story of who we are in our diversity, in our many, many diversities, um, and having also lived in three different provinces, how the regional differences also define us uh, in, to some degree, um, and, and how, how different those stories are. Also, whether you're based in an urban environment or a rural environment, it's, a, you know, there's there is so much in terms of the layered history of Muslims in Canada. And um, a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is about the shifting of this power and to try and put together some of the infrastructure pieces that will allow us to shift that power with the hope that eventually when we look at systems that will move from policies to all sorts of other things that will eventually get to the most stubborn part of systems change, which is uh, changing our mental models and the way that people see us and the way that we exist, um, you know, in, in a lot of, uh, I would say, pop culture spaces, is especially. Um, because that's where a lot of people form their opinions of us. They don't form their opinions so much on academic liter literature. It's about the stuff they consume every single day. And how do we make um, work like this that is so crucial, the academic kind of backbone of, 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 uh, of the work that you're doing, how do we make that accessible in a way that it also infiltrates the, the pop culture ecosystem? Um, so that, you know, there's a possibility for impact beyond anything we could have imagined. And so I'm just thrilled that, that this is happening and um, just really excited about it all. Thank you so much, Sanya. Um, the next person we have, I have on my list actually, um, is Dr. Jennifer Selby. So um, uh, Dr. Selby is an associate professor at the Department of Religious Studies at Memorial University. Um, and like I mentioned before, Memorial is actually an academic partner of MICA's and we're really, really happy um, to have her here today. Uh, yes, okay, I was just about to ask you if you can share your screen, okay. Sorry about that, I just had to unmute myself. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Mosca. It's really great to see so many friends and, um, and partners of, with, the, with the MECA project. My name is Jennifer Selby, and I'm a professor at Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador. You can see our little emblem on the top uh, left-hand corner, and uh, that's the province of uh, Newfoundland in the bottom and Labrador in the top. So uh, I have been a partner with um, Anver and Mosca since the beginning of the Mika project. And I'm really thrilled that um, with my partner here, the Muslim Association of Newfoundland and Labrador, we've been able to launch this um, kind of comparable and we could say sister or brother archive um, way out here on the East Coast. So uh, with, especially with a postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Aisha Akinturk, who's um, on the call as well. She's been really um, formative and fabulous uh, in working with me. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out. Um, you can navigate the website yourselves if you'd like to see it. It's just nlmuslimlives.ca. Um, and we've had uh, some really like really fabulous students work on this project with us too for the last couple of years. So I would say that uh, we've been doing a couple of things. We've not only been receiving archival material, but we've also been looking for it and creating it. Um, and so I, I just would maybe share three little takeaways uh, that we've 
that we have had um, since the beginning of the project. Um, so first we found um, very different stories than I think than what we expected. And here, um, it's too bad Dr. Akinter couldn't be speaking with me right now, but we found some different stories for example, even narratives about who was the first Muslim to settle here in Newfoundland and Labrador. We have changed that narrative. We found different people, earlier folks. Um, so it's really thrilling actually to, um, to be able to be part of that a little bit detective story, but also to really show that the narrative that Muslims are only newcomers in this province is inaccurate. We've conducted 22 or 21 or 22 oral history narratives, especially with elders in the community. So that's been very special um, it just in hearing all of their stories. And I think it's also been extremely meaningful for them. So those are videos that uh, we will be depositing into the archive, as well as the transcripts and uh, all of the information that they talk about. But the aspect that I'm that I'm really kind of thrilled about, um, and this is just also in an interview that I conducted on earlier this week, is hearing different people talk about archival materials on camera and then donate those materials. So um, it is just really special. Uh, if you want to see some of the videos of some of the folks that we've interviewed, just short clips, you can just click here on this um, icon and that will take you to our Instagram page. And uh, there, Aisha and uh, one of our students, Ben, have been really busy kind of clipping with little video clips uh, from some of our interviews. So I think you'll enjoy watching those. And lastly, I guess what we're most, um, I think is most meaningful in this project is establishing an archive space here in Newfoundland and Labrador at the Queen Elizabeth II Library and with the Archives and Special Collections um, to hold these materials in perpetuity. So that to me is really the legacy and the importance of this community project. And um, just really excited about how much buy-in we've had from the community here. And I think that's also in part because of this kind of broader Canadian project and the fabulous partners that we've um, that we have uh, at the University of Toronto. Um, but yeah, if you just navigate through our website, you can see more of the activities that we've done. We did a short presentation with the public libraries here about some of our findings last October for Islamic History Month and anyway, many other things. So I invite you to check out our website. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, and thank you, Zad, for putting the, the email. Oh, and thank you, Aisha, as well, for putting uh, the Instagram link. I was just going to put it in myself. Uh, I really encourage everyone to um, check out some of the clips, on, especially on the Instagram link. Uh, uh, there's just some, some amazing stories that you can find there. Um, so uh, the next um, uh, person who we have um, uh, speaking is Imam Abdelhai Patel. Um, Imam Patel has been one of our, like, very early supporters and um, he's a leader in the Canadian Muslim community as well. Um, and I'm actually also a founder of the Canadian Council of Imams. So um, Imam Patel, thank you so much for joining and thank you for um, agreeing to speak for a, for a few minutes. Well, I don't know how I can recount 53 years of history living here in Canada. I'm not the earliest Muslim, but uh, listening to Jennifer, uh, Professor Jennifer, I. Also, I was thinking as, as we started that one of the early uh, or early European explorers were Vikings that came to Cap Canadian shore. If I'm correct, uh, Professor, can you correct me? And Vikings, I, I also read recently about how they uh, came as far as Spain and many Muslims joined them and they took back a number of Muslims, either some women as well and back to uh, Scandinavia. And Muslims were known as sailors, experts in that Columbus took many of them in his voyage, both voyages that came with them. And even uh, when the Norwegian explorer uh, for Herdal tried to prove the, uh, the people from West Africa came to the West, uh, to the New World, then he also brought a couple of Muslims with him there as well. So Knowing the expertise of the uh, fellowship of Muslims, I'm sure that Vikings may have also had Muslims come to the uh, Canadian shore 
in those days. I think that is something to explore a few days, I would say. But uh, when I heard about the NACA, I said, this is something I said, I have been looking forward and it so happened, I'm glad it in my lifetime because uh, I have lived, I mean, for over 50 years here in this country and seen the Muslim community, not community, we are not one community, that's the problem, we are community. And we have grown and we have flourished, we have contributed enormously to the Canadian society, Canadian uh, Canada as a whole. And my uh, Marcus Garvey said that people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. So we uh, need to, uh, how can we remember? Because as I speak to the new arrivals in Canada and they don't have a clue what the early Muslim, what we went through, what I personally went through. And in the early days over here when there were hardly few Muslims, when I came here in 69, and there were about a thousand Muslims in my estimation, and only those were visible in, if they come to the mosque. There was only one mosque at, at the beginning when I came. That was the Jami Mosque. Uh, and that came about from the uh, uh, earlier uh, informal uh, mosque at Kiel and Dundas. And the church was brought in fact the same open same month that I arrived in 1969 the, at 56 Boasted Avenue. And uh, the Islamic Foundation split from there and were praying at a school in Bathurst and uh, Adelaide Primary School. And that's where I was introduced by my host who took me there for a prayer on Sunday and there was Nisful Shaban that came about. And so I went there and made contacts with uh, some of the Muslim. So, but I didn't come in contact with the West until a lot later. And when I became the, uh, uh, when I was elected to the National Executive of Muslim Student Association in 72, when I traveled to Winnipeg and they had six Muslim families at that time in 1972. Today they have over 40,000 Muslims in, in Winnipeg. I went to Edmonton and another town, Lakla Beach, uh, Calgary, went for all those at that time, established MSA chapters in those uh, cities as well. But uh, nothing really recorded of why we don't have the record, that's the problem, is that many arrivals in the uh, early days, especially in 69, 70, when came here, and a number of them went back, or those who stayed here, they didn't really want to stay in Canada. And even myself, I came as a student, I have no family here, so I didn't think that I would be applying even for permanent residence. The only reason I did was, okay, if I want to continue studying, and I said, I better get the permanent residence so I can get some exemption in fees. So this is one of the things, and I heard this from a number of uh, my elders uh, who, were, who came, and this was in the late 70s and 80s that the biggest mistake we made, we never decided that we will be staying here. Many wanted to maybe make money, maybe go back or get education and go back or just uh, experience. Uh, there was no, uh, there was also a question of survival of Islamic faith, of their identity, because the, the atmosphere was not there for to preserve our uh, Islamic values or so on among children. So the many thought that say, I don't think I want to stay. And for that reason, many went back. Some returned at a later year, but as the children returned if they were born here, but the majority of them never thought of sort of preserving anything. So we, have been out of this survival mode after nearly 20 years or so, or 30 years, and into the establishment mode, which we are now still, because the community keeps growing. And there is still this hesitancy among many new arrivals, especially refugees, that if they can go back to their home country or stay here. And many feel that their Islamic uh, their faith was threatened. So that's one of the reasons, but those who decided, especially those who come from countries where there were minorities like India and others, they thought of say, okay, we have out of that country from uh, other countries where they were persecuted or not, much, not many rights. They said, we will make Canada home. And that's, those people stayed here and said, okay, this is our home. But uh, Keeping the records was another factor that many, some of the people believe that, okay, photography is haram, so some of them never really preserved the photos on that sense. And that I'm struggling with another country that I have lived in and uh, 
in Barbados, where I grew up part of my life. And uh, right now we are looking at the archives there about the early settlers that Muslims came from in 1928. So there's hardly any record. People destroy photographs of the first masjid that they built and so on. So this is a, this kind of thinking also is a problem for collecting the things like that. But I have seen like the community has a good history and bad history as well. So we have had the first court case, for example, of a masjid of Jamia Mosque back in 1975, uh, uh, 73, sorry. And the case was thrown out on the basis that there are no laws to judge, uh, for a judge to say that, okay, a masjid should be open five times a day as one of the demands. In the thing. So the laws are not governed. Uh, churches have their laws that because they were the early nation builders, their Christian community. But uh, there are many laws still, some of them are Muslim think uh, that they don't have the like, uh, Muslim laws in our institutions. But we have been living uh, as a minority and Canadian laws are such that they have accommodated most of our needs, especially marriage, for example. Any imam or any pre, uh, other faith leader performs the marriage with a license, then that is registered automatically. I, I see that as the biggest achievement, biggest accommodation. And there are other ways that Muslims are also accommodated because of the, the values are similar. But people looking for some other things over there in a non-Muslim country that say, okay, this is not an Islamic state. So there are other 50 issues they want to bring in and discuss that, that is another point. But I would say that I can uh, answer any questions uh, about my early, uh, the early life in uh, Canada, which I hope to start writing. And I have all the collection now I'm digitizing that I can hand them over the videotapes of my own interviews and other, some of the events and so on. Plus I have uh, also a collection which uh, from uh, one of the pioneers, late Mohinuddin, uh, who established, uh, who is a pioneer for Islamic Foundation, Muslim Indian Council of Muslim Communities, and his wife, Sister uh, Talad, I call her grandmother of the community. And they have also, uh, I, I have about 30 or more Islam Canada magazines that I have. And you have got permission, so at some point, I have to hand them over to you. The other collection I'm asking people that bring photographs. In fact, yesterday I met one of my old timers who's been here 67, since 1967. And something we have been trying to arrange a meeting of the alumni of the 60s. Those who came in the 60s, number of them have died, may Allah bless them. And we hope to have something in July for uh, such a gathering that we, if we can appeal, and I'm appealing to most of this much Muslim seniors gathering to bring out any collection they have, photographs or any. Now, many don't know about our Muslim scientists' contribution in this country. Many were work, have worked for Canada Research Council. And where I were my former employer, Ontario Hydro, we had a lot of Muslim scientists who have built our nuclear station, AECL, as well as Atomic Energy of Canada. There are a lot of them. So that in professional life, Muslims have contributed quite enormously besides on the academic side, which has been there for from the beginning of 20th century, long before, I mean, other immigrant arrivals as uh, workers or laborers. But the academic, many professors in university, like McGill, uh, University of Toronto, where Dr. Gay was there, and McGill, the uh, late Dr. Ismail Farooqi, was there, and many students were coming just to be there, his students, in the uh, uh, early 70s that have been there. So that, all things, we need to explore those records if we can have. And some of those graduates went back to their home country and became deans and other uh, professors, uh, academics, researchers as well, authors in their home country. And they have listed Canadian history or Canadian, some part of Canada. But there is a lot to be learned. And I think now what we need to do, Moscow, is also to start program in schools with school boards. No, I, I absolutely, I, I agree. And I, I think um, that's uh, part of programming we hope to uh, to figure out in the future once we have more donations. And um, I I should have mentioned earlier that, you know, Imam Patel is, has been extremely important for us um, for connecting to the Muslim community. And um, like you mentioned, you, you're also 
uh, I'm going to be donating hopefully to us soon as well when uh, once we get that uh, get that ball rolling. But um, thank you so much, Imam Patel, for uh, for joining us and speaking. Um, I, I, we do have a little bit of time left uh, um, for our next speaker, um, and uh, so our final uh, speaker for tonight is um, Hani Hassan. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, Hani, uh, Hani's from the London Muslim community, London, Ontario Muslim community, and was also, also actually a speaker in our last event um, uh, where we um, partnered with the Archives of Ontario, and we were able to, uh, and who actually have a collection of, um, of uh, news clippings from the 1950s to 1970s that document um, uh, the the London's London's uh, Muslim community. So we have that event uh, that happened um, not too long ago, and it's it's on our YouTube channel if anybody's interested in uh, rewatching that. But thank you again, uh, Hadi, for joining us. Um, we have a few minutes left. If you had uh, some final words, well, I would thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I was going to tell uh, Imam Patel he's a virtual youngster. <laughs> uh, I, I was just blessing God. Thank you for. <laughs> He, he's made an immense contribution. We're, we're, we're friends, Imam Patel, and I, I, I hope we are. And, and Compared uh, to you. <laughs> so my father came in 1913 to Canada, and I was born here 82 years ago. Uh, so I've been here since the formative days, uh, and I've been mulling over how I'm going to make my con contribution to Micah. I've spoken to uh, 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 Mosca a bit, and uh, I have a dilemma about whether or not it should be local or broader, uh, as we have archives here at, uh, at Western. On the other hand, uh, I, I would hope to make a donation so that uh, the Islamic content of my archives would be available to others and might not be so accessible at Western and in MICA. So, Mosca, I'll be talking with you uh, uh, and Amber, uh, uh, sometime soon about what I'm going to do and how we can, how we can share the resources. Uh, because the, the, the period that I have, uh, I think important archives for, is the period before uh, that, that, that Imam Patel spoke about, the, the period before the 1960s, uh, when there were only a few uh, Muslims in, in Canada and in North America. And, those were actually the formative years of the early mosques in Edmonton, London, Windsor, and Calgary, and, and Toronto, when there were only uh, a few people uh, of our faith uh, present. And, uh, uh, and we faced different challenges uh, because we were so few and there, was, there were no uh, resources. Uh, uh, we heard uh, Haroon speak uh, about uh, the lack of lack of uh, resources and and continuity in the early days and and that was always a challenge so but there is an important part of the history because uh, a couple of the organizations that have been spoken about here tonight uh iman patel uh reminded us about Muin Muin Adin and, and tala uh, and they were both very active in many organizations um, Moeen was instrumental with uh, Dr. Fraud Jain in establishing the, uh, uh, the National Muslim Christian Liaison Committee, which continues to exist in Toronto. It's probably the foremost national uh, Muslim Christian uh, relationship uh, that continues uh, on. And your earlier guest, guest Mani uh, Nasser, in fact, is the Muslim co chair of that. Of that organization, um, uh, uh, Moin was instrumental in uh, the founding of uh, uh, the Council of Muslim Communities of Canada, along with Dr. Shaheen and others. Uh, Islam Canada has been mentioned as the newsletter of the Council of Muslim Communities of Canada. Moin was the first editor of that of that publication, and. Uh, that's the first magazine. <laughs> the first magazine, the first, the first magazine. And uh, subsequently, uh, Salman Qadri, whose son went on to become a member of the provincial legislature, an MPP for Ontario from Toronto, 
So Man Cadre then took over the editorial responsibility for Islam Canada. And, uh, and so there's a, a long legacy. I, I suspect that a collection of Islam Canada is not intact with anybody. So we'll, we'll have to piece it together from fragments with various people. I'm glad to hear Imam Patel that you have uh, a substantial collection. I have some uh, copies going way back uh, of that magazine as well. And I imagine that Talat and Wayne also have some of the early editions. So you, I'm you, looking for one particular edition that first said about the Qibla being Northeast. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find that edition. <laughs> so that, 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 raises an, that raises an interesting story. I had, I had, after I graduated, I'd left London and returned uh, in the early 70s, uh, 10 years. Uh, after I graduated from university, I returned to London and they told me, hey, you, when I came, went to the mosque, they said, hey, you have to meet this new guy here at the mosque. He's a convert. His name is Khalil Dudani. Well, his name was uh, uh, Key Dudney, Khalil, Khalil Dudney. I don't know if you've met him, man. He was involved with uh, 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 an organization that Dr. Begg in Toronto organized. Uh, yeah, a I think I remember him, yeah. Anyways, uh, he, 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 Khalil had been a new convert. And he was a, a, a math prof at Western. And he had brought a globe in to demonstrate <laughs> the Qibla by taking elastic and showing uh, the shortest distance. And the mosque actually was built in London, was built with the uh, Qibla direction going east. And it was after that that the Qibla was moved to uh, to, to the northeast, sort of the northeast. Al Masjid became Qibla 10. <laughs> Al North. Anyways, uh, th there are a lot of stories, and this is really interesting, Musk, and I, I really thank you and the others who have uh, pulled this together. And uh, it seems like there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, to make this happen and make it work. And inshallah, we can uh, find a way to, to raise the endowment money that's needed, the walk and the ongoing funds and perhaps in this period of uh, heightened uh, um, attenuation to the Islamophobia, uh, we, we can get government assistance uh, to deal with this as a major effort to uh, strangle that uh, form of arts that keeps uh, raising its head uh, with uh, bad narratives about Muslims. So thank you. Thank you so much, Hani, and thank you for joining us again for yet another webinar. <laughs> um, I, I want to just uh, broadly thank uh, everybody um, for uh, uh, joining us and for uh, taking the time to speak about um, Mike. I think your support means uh, the world to the entire team, and it's uh, you know really keeps us all going. Um, uh, we I just wanted to um, share my slides again really quickly, right? So. Um, at this point, you know, every, we've all heard from uh, our wonderful supporters. You've heard a little bit about MICA as well and our process. And, um, you know, we're always looking for uh, more donors of records. But, and, and again, I want to emphasize again, anybody can be a donor of records. Anybody that self-identifies as a Muslim can be a donor um, and uh, donate their records. And uh, just like the slide says, um, the door to the archive is now open to you. Um, so uh, thank you again. Uh, we, uh, I just wanted I wanted to move on to our um, kind of a, a more open sort of discussion. I've, I've, we've already got a few questions in the Q and A in the uh, question box uh, that um, I'd like to, we can uh, answer. But um, these are some topics that I that um, you know I didn't get to go to to too much detail, and we can absolutely uh, I can uh, we can Amber and I can both answer. Um, if if anybody is interested, um, you know we can talk more about um, the team, um, the the current infrastructure we have going on, the endowment funding, and also um, I'm also looking to come to your own organizations if you um, are part of any Muslim organizations or any organization that has a, um, a Muslim fo following, um, and I'd love to do. Five, 10, 30 minute presentations um, about MICA and just to, uh, to again raise as, as much awareness as we can uh, for MICA and uh, get as many donations as we can as well. So, um, with that, I think 
I'll start off with the first question we have um, from Sarah. Uh, so uh, Sarah asks, uh, are your archives accessible to academic researchers? And if so, how does one gain access for research purposes? So at the moment, we are not, um, we, uh, at the moment, uh, we, we don't have access to our material just yet. Again, we are still processing um, our very first donations. Um, and uh, but once we do, like I'm, like I showed in, the, in an earlier slide, uh, they will be accessible. Um, some of the stuff will be accessible digitally on our uh, digital platform, um, and some some of the material will be just physical. So you'd have to actually physically come to our space. Um, but again, we do hope to um, at, at least what we want to make sure is online, so it is uh, uh, broadly accessible. Is the uh, descriptions, those catalog records, so that people do know that that um, collections exist. And if you um, had the capacity or ability to come for academic purposes again um, to uh, do research with the material, you're more than welcome to come to our space. But again, we don't have that set up just yet. We're still uh, working on our digital archive um, space for now. Oscar, can I can I add yes. to that? Is that you know just to Sarah's point? is that our aim is for you to be able to make an appointment at the Institute, come to the reading room where you'll be able to access the hard copies if they're not already digitized. Um, and just and in terms of timeline, um, as Mosca said, we're we're developing the digital landscape right now, which is it's a bit of a complicated endeavor to get it all right with respect to both security, server space, and maximal utility for the end users. So our hope is that by fall, of 2022, um, we'll be able to begin entertaining um, people into the Institute to begin using the archive. Uh, but by, because by that point, much of it will hopefully be by then, um, we'll have the online platforms ready, at least phase one and phase two. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amber, for adding, adding that. I always forget to add, um, add that part. Uh, the next question we have is uh, three questions in one, I guess. Um, so Nuzhat asks, are the archives gathering text histories regarding feminist and queer Muslims, um, Salam, et cetera? Um, there's a lot of essays, memoirs, novels, and plays by this point. Uh, so um, like I mentioned earlier, any um, anybody who self-identifies as Muslim is more than welcome to donate their materials to MICA. Um, we uh, especially focus and we do prioritize uh, minority or you know, underrepresented communities within uh, the Muslim community. So that includes, you know, women, youth, uh, queer Muslims, gender nonconforming, um, even uh, minority sects as well. So we do prioritize uh, the under underrepresented communities. Uh, and actually, to your point on um, uh, Salam Canada, they uh, I I am correct. From the last time I uh, I checked their website, I'm pretty sure their their material is being um, donated to the arch the archive. So um, a r a r q i v -E q u i v e s. Um, they are the the Canada's Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archive. So I believe their material is already like in the process of being donated there, uh, specifically for Salam. Um, the other question Anusad has is, there's amazing visual art made by Muslim artists. Yes. Um, are the archives collecting around that? Uh, so unfortunately, we don't collect art. We just don't have the capacity um, or even the expertise. I don't know um, anything about art collection. Um, we're, we're not a gallery, so we don't uh, collect visual art. Um, however, we do have really great relationships to um, like the Aga Khan Museum, the uh, Royal Ontario Museum, um, through the Institute of Islamic Studies itself, and maybe we can connect you to um, or connect these artists, for example, uh, to those organizations um, who typically do collect art like that. So, um, but if, uh, for us, I, we don't have the capacity to, to collect visual art. Um, uh, what, what we would have capacity for, for example, is if um, so an artist had, uh, I don't know, drafts or sketches or something like that um, um, before, you know, before their final uh, piece of work, I guess. Um, so those, those typically are okay. Um, I think th that'd be fine, but um, the actual visual art piece uh, we wouldn't be able to collect. Uh, the other question Nus had had it has is working class Oral histories, so taxi drivers, factory workers, especially women's lives. Oh, I'd love to have um, 
uh, oral histories of working class um, Muslims. That'd be amazing. I think, uh, again, like I said earlier, um, uh, uh, oral history, uh, oral history project is something we're looking into for the future. Um, and we, I'd love to be able to um, uh, do an oral history for as many communities as possible. Um, do you have any sort uh, so sorry, um, so Aisha is asking, oh, this had sent another. So I meant art documentation, gallery materials, not actual art. So um, so documentation of, of a piece of, uh, of art. So, you know, the, like, the, like I mentioned, like sketches and things like that, that's, that should be fine. Again, anything that's not three dimensional, I, I'd be able to, to um, uh, archive that Micah. Um, and I hope that answers, I hope that answers your question. Actually, if, if I could speak to the sure. art issue, because we've actually had some conversations. Um, someone was even talking about dresses at one point and fabric and, and fashion. And um, a lot will depend right now. We're in, I'm, I'm currently in negotiations with the University of Toronto Library. Um, it's in a consortium with a couple universities at uh, what's called the Downsview uh, storage space. And so I've negotiated with the chief librarian to add MICA into his next budget item as they expand the Downsview facility for the next storage space they have to create. Each, each storage space is about a $5 million infrastructure investment from, uh, from the University of Toronto Libraries. And so we're in that we're in that bucket and our hope is that as that gets approved going forward in the next year or so we'll be able to think about how to integrate art but also keep in mind that we have um, a series of art galleries at u of t and so part of what we've been doing through the islamic art collective which is a separate project at the institute is working with galleries um, we have our as our partners the rom and the aga khan museum but also we have a number of u of t galleries so it would just be a matter of trying to find the right place. Just for instance, like books, if you wanted to donate books, we'd wanna first talk to the library to see if they have the space for the books. Um, and so really the, the virtue of MICA, then I think what, what we're really grateful for is that we have these opportunities at U of T to take, but not necessarily house within MICA, but facilitate the preservation in the right spaces where people will find what you've donated. And that's the key is to really integrate the donation with future users. Thanks, Amber. Um, I, I noticed an, a question a lot early on in the chat box or the other chat box. Um, so the question was, do donated materials have to be original materials or will you take, uh, we also take copies of video audio print? So this is a good question because um, at the moment, we are we only do accept original material. Um, we are trying to figure out a way where we can do a kind of like um, digitize and return kind of post custodial model of archiving, which means you know we receive your material temporarily, um, digitize it, and then give you back the original. So we are looking to figure out how we can incorporate that within uh, Micah. Um, you know, again, as we're at, because we're also part of the University of Toronto, we have to kind of adhere to um, the university's legal standards as well. So um, it'll be a bit of a conversation, but it is something definitely on the back of my mind. Um, that you know, it's definitely something that we, we're going, we're also kind of working on on the side as well. Um, I, we had a question, so I'm just trying to go through both chats. Um, from um, Aisha, thank you again, Aisha, for joining. Um, do you have any sources which you can share about the about that court case from the 1970s? Oh, I think this is for you, uh, Imam Patel. Um, the case which uh, Brother Abdelhai Patel referred to in his remarks about not having relevant laws back then for such cases involving mosques. Oh, <laughs> Imam Patel is not here right now. So, um, okay, once he comes back, I'll, I'll come back to that question. Uh, the uh, another question I see is, uh, will you include an index of other archives where relevant material is available? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that is the just kind of what I call the description database where um, our uh, the archive you know archival material that even archival material that isn't in MICA will also be housed there. Where we'd like um, what I the way I kind of like to describe it is that um, if uh, if for example something exists at uh, the memorial, uh, the archives at Memorial University, um, with our partner, 
with our partner there, um, we'd like to be able to point to that. Um, um, hey, you are looking for this specific thing. It's actually found at this different archive um, at Memorial University. Here's the information there to go. And it will link it to the description or the catalog record at the Memorial at the Memorial University Archive website. So yes, we're uh, that is like the main goal of this 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 description database, I like to call it, um, trying to um, you know point to different archives that also have uh, Muslim uh, uh, Canadian Muslim materials as well. Oh, and I see Imam Patel is back. So I'll I ask the question that uh, there's a question for you actually, Imam Patel. Uh, it's a, um, it's a, do you have any source um, any sources which you can share about that court case that you mentioned from the 1970s, the one uh, with the the laws for um, for involving mosques? Yes, I have the uh, newspaper clipping from Globe and Mail about the uh, your dismissal of that case. Uh, I don't know who is looking for it. You can send me an email or I can pass on to you to pass on to the questioner. Oh, I'm sure. I you, can share my, you can share my email free. My email is public. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, we can yeah. do that. Oh, yes, Kathy, please go ahead. AFS is there at Rogers. Yeah. Do you want me to put I, I, my, my email in the chat box? Maybe I can put Sure, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. And then and Kathy, you can go ahead. Oh, I, I can't hear you. Oh, no. You're not muted, so that's not the issue. No, we can't. still can't hear you. Shoot. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, Kathy is saying that um, uh, she has the court case, uh, the court documents for that case as well. Um, so, uh, so I wonder if we can connect everyone. <laughs> um, let's see. We have up. Uh, we have, are, um, Kathy, are you um, uh, comfortable with me sharing your uh, email uh, with um, this person? Okay, sure. Um, I, was I have I have Kathy if I can email. No. Oh, you want to do you want to do a, a group email then like a, a CC Kathy as well? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you both. Are Are there any other questions, uh, Andrew? I think you. Oh no, you're muted now. Um, you were unmuted earlier, so I thought you there was well, something you wanted to one say. One thing I can say, Moscow, is that uh, in the last uh, ten years, I would say, especially from 2010 to 15 more than 20 masjids have been in court. And this is over management uh, leadership struggle, not the other. So, and this is only in Ontario. I don't know about other provinces that people have uh, spent so much money in court cases over uh, management uh, issues. And I only knew these from the defense lawyers who are asking me for mediation. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have known that there are cases in court. <laughs> so we have about five minutes left. Um, I don't see any more questions. Are there any more? Oops. Um, OK. Thank you, uh, Kathy, for, um, for connecting with Aisha. Um, is there anything, any other questions? I'm just trying to scroll through because I know we've been um, using both chat boxes. Okay, no, I don't think I see any more. Okay. Oscar, might I add a, just a, a parting thought as a director, yes, if that's please. all right? Um, so I wanted to just, uh, I've been, you know, it was, uh, I've been, I've been so entranced in today's session. Uh, I'm actually been entranced in every session. Um, you know, when we had the last uh, the last session on the London mosque, there were moments when I actually found myself tearing up hearing the stories, watching Hanny point out his wife in that in the video when she was 18 and he was 19 at the center of that table and the con the conversations that were happening in the chat functions um, were really were really um, energizing, were really enthralling. And and I say this because you know I'm I'm a 
professionally, I'm a, I'm a trained medievalist. I, I don't deal with modern history, let alone, you know, uh, 20th, 19th or 20th century history. And in more recent years, I've taken to looking at things like anti-terrorism, anti-terrorism financing, and, and some of you know the work that we've done in that regard here at the Institute. And let's face it, it's depressing, it's hard, and it's challenging to deal with. Um, there's one, but then there's MICA. And, um, and for those of you who've been to the events will probably have a similar feeling as me, is that MICA is the one project where um, I see a future that's more hopeful. I see I can put aside all the day-to-day -day grind that's going on around refugees today, that's going on around Afghanistan, and for a few moments, just enjoy the fact that there is a, a rich history that, one, I'm proud to be a part of, but two, that I can take my children to, that they can see and see it as their history as well. And, you know, we, we, uh, my wife works in the, in the area of indigenous child welfare. And one of the things that she writes and has talked to me a lot about was how one of the biggest challenges for indigenous communities in maintaining their, their place in society is, there, is, is regaining that forced erasure of that history as they were all removed from their families, from their communities, from that history. And, and it was really an erasure that they're contending with. And so um, one of the strongest features I have, not just in terms of thinking about how to combat Islamophobia, but for me, it's as the father of two young children is, I want my children to be proud of who they are in a climate that has signaled that maybe they ought not to be. And, uh, and that's an important thing for me as a father. It's, for, it's, it's an important thing for me as an academic. Um, but it's, it's, it's important enough for me to, to think that this could be an institution for all of us. And so when we, you know, when we talk about the MICA door is open, it's, it's your door. And it's a door that we hope you'll come through and, and walk through and join with us. As Kathy and, and others who've donated to us will tell you, every time there's a, don a donation of, of a set of records, it's not just a one-off. It's a relationship that we build with you. We at MICA are here to create relationships with all of you to enhance the, the standing of the stories that you bring, but the side stories that are always embedded in the records that you have. And our hope is that in, in walking this path together, um, you can make MICA not just a U of T project or an Institute of Islamic Studies project, but our collective project. And so I, my hope is that you see this as yours, as much as you know, it's myself, Mosca, Emily, and Hassan as the team here locally working on it, this really is uh, a collective project, one that really needs a community to, be, uh, to make it real. And we're really delighted to have you. And, and we hope that you come away feeling as, in, as, in, as enlivened and hopeful about the future as I certainly do every time I, I come away from a mic event. So I just wanted to say thank you for, for joining us this evening. Um, th thank you, um, Amber, for that. I think um, um, I've had such a wonderful journey, journey just like being part of this project. Um, and uh, I'm very, very blessed to have met all the people that are here today and also who um, aren't here just yet, uh, who aren't here today as well. And um, I, I like, like Amber said, you know, we're, um, we're we're just so blessed to hear everybody's stories and uh, be part of this change as well. Um, I think, you know, we have, uh, I have my contact info on the screen there. If anybody is ever interested in donating to Micah or even talking to me at all about anything related to Canadian Muslim history, I'd love to talk to you. Um, and I think, you know, oh, it, I guess uh, we were actually exactly on time, which almost never happens. Um, so I guess with that, um, I just, I'd like to say again, thank you everyone for joining, um, for all of you um, who, you know, for everyone who is participating, you know, I know, I hope you have a blessed Ramadan as well. Um, and uh, well, I look forward for more Micah, we're, we're just getting, we're, all, we're really just getting started. There's so much more that's happening and we have so much in, um, that's going to be happening in the future. And um, we're, we're very, very excited for everyone that's uh, supporting us and following our journey. And so uh, thank you again. Um, so with that, I think um, I will stop the recording.